This is for the nerds. This is for the brainiacs. This is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back. You ain't gonna touch me. You not gonna do nothing. You are not above me. I bet you wish you was me. I know it. I know. What's up, everybody? Welcome on this glorious Monday to another episode of the Only Friends podcast. Where the fuck is Chin? Where is he? I am Chin. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've lost our co-host. He's the kitty corner to be is found. no more. It's yeah, the kitty corner is dead. Landon's retired. He's off gallivanting across the country, mm. playing God knows what at this point. <laughs> Christian's working the late shift. Can't get him out of bed. This is a problem. This is we, we run a we run a two p.m. show, <laughs> and sleep schedule is somehow an issue for two fifths of the team. I think we should record at like eight a.m. because then he I'm could just it. come straight from the casino. Oh my god! I'm worth it. Well, then we lose Melissa. You you would have like, me like fifteen percent of the time. I would take the under. Okay. The under of fifteen. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And the the like ten percent that we did get you, you would be such a fucking. I would be grouch. miserable. I would be like. Why am I here? This I I don't want to wake up early. Don't want to be on. She'd be like, you have a sleep disorder. <laughs> yeah, I would say that. <laughs> uh, that's great. Holy, old people and people with sleep disorders are up this fucking early. <laughs> the fuck's wrong with you? <laughs> what you like to watch the sunrise? What kind of disorder do you have? <laughs> it's true. Goddamn psychopath. It's true. That's basically oh. what she said to me earlier in the chat for leaving early. You do have a sleep disorder. <laughs> yeah, no, you actually do. <laughs> there's, there's something clearly clinically wrong with you. I don't understand Am it. Am I like, the only normal one in this entire group? Well, I, I think crickets. Is that what? Yeah, probably. <laughs> no, okay. Probably. I'm not normal. I don't think anyone's switching places with you. Anytime soon is all I'm saying. That's fine. I mean, you do Good have us. you do have the glam shot. I'll, I'll give you that much, and you can stir up the barbecue. So oh, you do man. have a lot going for yeah. you in that regard. Also, nice fucking shirt. Thank you. I was waiting. Nobody commented on it. That all is day. that. Well, that's all because I'm the only one in this room. Yeah, I've never seen that shit. Who's ever seen Friends? I mean, I've seen it, but it's not like something. I've, I've recently switched back to uh, fan girl watching Friends as I fall asleep. Same. So Same. like, I was on a. We were on like a um, uh, office kick for a long time, mm. which I don't think you've ever watched The Office. I've seen like four episodes. Oh, it's man. too stupid. You gotta give it. So you gotta it's just give too it stupid for me. It is not stupid. It's stupid. Wait. It's so stupid. I, I'm I'm How not saying it's the not office funny. Stupid and uh, friends listen, isn't. Yeah. Listen, I'm not saying it's not funny. I'm not saying it's not a good show. I'm saying it's the it's the type of stupid humor that makes me cringe. You don't like, like cringe humor. I don't like the role Steve Car uh, Steve Carell plays in that show. Like isn't he's overtly obtuse and stupid to a fault and it's just like this level of incompetence to me is unbearable Friends, and then it's just like a trickle down effect where like dwight's somehow fucking worse like he's more incompetent and he's sinister on top of it you've only seen four episodes how do you know I, it's because I I'm, I keep up with social social cultural He's references. It. Yeah, he watched. No, it. I, was, I, I get the phone. The, the office are all the I same. I actually would take the under You would love the whole P Pam and Jim story. Oh my yeah, God. of course. That's but the that's, best you would just part of it. eat it up. But that's the biggest that problem is, that I have with is they're clearly the two most competent characters, and yeah. they're not in a position of power. I can't take it. Yeah, but Maybe that's they the are whole, if you'd watch the show. No, it would be like it would be like if Joey and Phoebe were the two main characters of Friends. Unwatchable. No. Just unwatchable. They're the best. They're the best, like you know, ancillary characters. They're, they're good support. They drive the the narratives along. They throw a couple zingers in. There. How you doing? Yeah, that's great, right? But like, if I had to watch a Joey Phoebe dynamic instead of Ross and Rachel, I'm fucking out. Yeah, but it's it's not like that. I don't yeah, know. I, 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 I there's not a lot I can say. I just watch the show. I think there's a better chance I would like the Ricky Gervais version. I, I tried that. It that was I've never terrible. seen, so I don't know. That was the original. Yeah, that, I right. did not yeah. like it. But it was you only like, like it? it was only a couple seasons. But right? I love I cringe. Like I love awkward humor and like things that are so uncomfortable that you laugh. Yeah. So that's not for everyone. I I deep down am incredibly introverted. Like I worked very hard to get it out. Like uh, a lot of things when I was a child would make me run and hide. Yeah. Because it was 
too cringe for me. Right. Like <laughs> moments in storylines where it's predictable how embarrassing what's about to happen to the uh -huh. characters. I can't mm -hmm. watch. Yeah. <laughs> and like I was the kid who like I couldn't order food at a at a drive through window. Right. Until I was like 14. Uh -huh. It was just too much for me. So it's like that type of humor just doesn't write fart jokes like yeah. <laughs> uh bridesmaids where the girl's shitting in the street i am in it's for happening. that all it's happening day it it's happening. <laughs> i yes. think cringe is the funniest thing oh uh, yeah it, I, I i just can't do it i just love I, but i love being uncomfortable and like feeling sure. like i have such you like a, making others uncomfortable i have such a morbid <laughs> curiosity too that like anything that just like you shouldn't want to watch like i want to watch it right so. like beheadings no, I've seen, I've seen them. <laughs> I don't enjoy it though. Or necrophilia. I don't, I've never watched necrophilia. I you watched, literally sent us a link. I watched an <laughs> interview. I watched an interview with a necrophile and it was very eye-opening. Very eye-opening. What did you learn, Melissa? Honestly, by the end of it, I was like, I would probably let this guy have his way with my dead body. Jesus <laughs> he, because, because he fuck. seemed like he really like cares. <laughs> This is why I don't go through the, the 300 messages and I wake I, up to in the morning. And I have a disorder. <laughs> <laughs> he really seemed like he cared. Like, oh. he, he really had deep oh, reverence. Be empathetic. He had deep reverence for the body. <laughs> right. He, he fucked it in a respectable way is what you're saying. Yes, you just, you'd have to watch it to understand. Right, right, right. Oh, sure. No, um, no I do... Uh, just to bring that conversation full circle, I, I do really appreciate British humor, which is why I think I would like the Ricky Gervais version. I feel like there's Possibly. no version of him that could just be as stupid as and, and unwitting as Steve Carell plays in The Office. I imagine it to be a much more snide, like crisp, sarcastic version of the show. Uh, I could be wrong. But the more Maybe. you watch it, the more endearing Steve Carell becomes. Yeah. To yeah. you. No, to you. I to you if no, you watch I, I agree, because I used to watch it in snippets, like, and I never, like, watched it straight through. And and I kind of thought, like, what you did and, and, yeah. and what you say is, is, is really true. Like, his character grows and you, you start to, like, you know, develop you a sort of for him. his and, vulnerability right, behind Right, exactly. His whole and you're, thing. like, you're rooting for him. You're, like, okay, well, they actually, they, yeah, like when they he, accomplished what they were trying yeah, like to do. Like, when him and Holly are dating and then it, you see him, like, I don't know, it's just. Yo, spoilers. Yeah. Come on, you're not going to watch it. <laughs> No, I'm never watching, for sure. Uh, Literally never, ever, ever watching. That's fine. There's but too Friends, much. greatest show on TV, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there could be much of an argument there. I mean, that's not what the, um, Can't argue that. That's not what the poll is saying. You and your goddamn polls. There's oh, I like the polls. That's votes. good. You, we Conrad loves to make we? polls to prove Berkey wrong. <laughs> Right, because somehow, like, the 18 people who tuned in to the first three minutes of the show, their opinions are fucking gold. No offense, guys, but... Yes, first they off, are. It's, it's 14, and all, <laughs> yeah, every single one of them is fucking gold, all right? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure, because it's probably, like, 90% against here. Um, big weekend. A lot of things were underway. Uh, a lot of things that this group collectively probably did not watch. Uh, everything from UNC... Duke, sorry, Melissa, mm. to the Grammys, uh, sorry, me. Um, but Lamanna watched it all. Lamanna was tuned in to fucking <laughs> everything. Yeah, I watched it all. <laughs> Glued to the TV. <laughs> Couldn't get enough of it. One of the last remaining normal citizens of the world. Everyone used to watch the Grammys. He really is like the most prototypical adult of everybody on this set. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. Like yeah. he really just grew into the forty-year-old well, version. That's because we all have of... like really severe mental illness, and he yeah. he does little less. All right. you guys and all your disorders. <laughs> We're all disordered. <laughs> and I'm the only normal one. Uh, so let's let's start first and foremost with uh, I won't call it the biggest news, but. Um, as far as sports goes, one of the bigger events that took place this weekend, UNC plays Duke. Uh, final final time that they'll meet under the Coach K regime. Uh, real barn burner of a finish uh, where basically the two teams exchanged threes for the better part of two minutes until finally UNC uh, hit a, a game-winning three that Duke couldn't really recover from. Really interesting spot from a game theory standpoint. Um, Duke had a, I think there was 18 seconds left in the game. And Duke was shooting a uh, one and one with down by th three. No, down by four. 
um, with a foul shooter who was 68%. No, it was 10. There was only 10 seconds left. Okay, 10.8 10 10 seconds, 10. seconds. Okay, 10 right. seconds and it left. Was, and they were, and it was, they were in the, the bonus, right? No. Uh, bonus? Maybe, maybe. I guess it yeah, doesn't matter because he, he made the first one, so I'm not sure either bonus, way. Right. Okay, but yeah, either way, they have a foul shooter on the line who's 68%, 10 seconds left in the game. So effectively, um, you know, at most, they're probably going to get one more possession. Down by four, he makes the first one. And, or sorry, down by three, he makes the... F no, down by four. Yeah, that's correct. Down by four, he makes the first one. So now they have the decision of, do you attempt to make the second free throw, go down by two, and then... Five. Oh, no, I was right. They were down by three. God, I got to get this right. Down by three, makes the first one, now down by two. Uh, so now he has the option of making the second free throw and being down by one, which means that it'll be a one possession game no matter what, and they'll get the ball back probably with, you know, three seconds, four seconds, depending on how quickly they foul. Or do you attempt to brick the second free throw and just take your possession now? And I was heavy on the side of, I think you should try to brick this because he's not a high enough percentage foul shooter to really leave this up to the to the odds right it's like if you have your guard on the line who's shooting 85 plus percent like okay yeah definitely go for the two makes but in this particular instance it seems and maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong about like what percentage of uh, yeah likelihood I don't know. you are of getting the rebound i don't know what the exact like what the right play is it seems to me i'm kind of on the other side i think with 10 10.8 seconds left like it's it's enough time to try to make the shot and then well it's not about it. time Course, it's about right? no because it's about when he misses when he misses the game ends because now you foul uh, i mean it, it, ends, it ends a really high percentage of the time yeah because now you foul and they make well, two they have free to make throws them both right yeah but yeah. It, you know you're fouling a guard almost right, right, always right. right because they have mm -hmm. uh they, they have their small small team in so it's really like a matter of like what's the probability of you getting a rebound off of a normal miss versus uh an intentional miss and i would assume the intentional miss is much greater uh, but maybe I'm way, way off here. I feel like it's so hard to like to intentionally miss and and be able to set it up for a rebound. I think it's only hard because they're the the rule is it's not like they practice these things. I don't think they have to. For sure, yeah, they have to. They definitely they? have. They definitely 100%. have to. But I think that there's a rule that the ball has to hit the rim, right? the rim yeah. prior to the backboard. Yeah. Uh, so that you can't just like whip it off the glass. Right. Right. It just has to hit the rim. Maybe in general. In general. I yeah. I said prior because it seems like you could, I mean, you could still like bank it pretty hard off the glass and just hit the iron. Uh, but in any event, like he did try to go for uh, both free throws, missed the second one and the game just ended. Really wild finish though. Coach K obviously now retired. Uh, pretty interesting shot of him uh, kind of looking on into the crowd as uh as he accepts his defeat unc now goes on to the finals to play kansas who beat villanova um pretty interesting turn of events all things considered with unc being an eight seed but uh i think the bigger story is obviously coach k's retirement and uh really funny thing that nike did they put a tweet out that i think has since been deleted that says you can't spell champion without k and you know nobody really understood what it was and then they followed nice. up with this video of all these other uh attributes that you can't spell without k and i get the sentiment right like basically they're trying to say like coach k embodied all of these things right. and uh you know they'll never be the same without him or whatever but uh i think whoever was running this campaign <laughs> they they misunderstand plays like they a might play on words. not be like English as their first language. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, literally, I can spell all those things without yeah, K. Maybe a, uh, like intentionally, you chose words that don't have K in them. I or? wonder how long they spent on that on that ad campaign because it's just like that seems to me like it was like. Thrown together. All right, fuck it. We're going with the you can't spell without yeah. K. Thing. That was like us when we have no right. run of show and we're just yeah. like, okay, whatever. We're just yeah. talking about I, anything. Should, Click record. We're going live. <laughs> yeah. We'll figure it out on the fly. That's yeah. That can't. That was definitely either uh, English as a second language or hour. who cares? Yeah, who cares? <laughs> uh, yeah, wasn't wasn't exactly the the best way to honor the coach. I but you know the sentiment is true. Obviously, he was like a pure class act and one of the best to ever. Do it second only behind John Wooden as far as NCAA championships go. Uh, so really impressive career. I think it's going to be a great finals. Uh, again, I haven't followed college basketball very closely, but just watching throughout the tournament, UNC looks fucking good. Mm -hmm. 
They look really good. Kansas looks strong as they always do. Uh, both of these are storied franchises. They're going to be adding, who knows? I, I don't pay close enough attention to know like how many NCAAs each of them have won, but I know it's more than one. Right. So uh, they're just going to be adding to the legacy one of these two teams. Uh, the finals are a Monday. week from today. Is that right? No, wait. wait no, no, they're tonight. Tonight. Oh, it's that's right. Nice. Yeah, it's like Monday, which is today. Wait, yeah. really? Yeah. I thought they always put a week be- in between, no? Not for the finals. In the- oh, it's not like the Super Bowl? They just roll right into it? Yep. All right. Well, finals are tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Who's watching? Me. Uh, me and Melissa. We're going to be uh, sitting in front no, row with No, but show popcorn. me their faces, and I'll tell you who to, <laughs> who to bet on. <laughs> just show the starting, starting five, and you can figure out who's going to be the uh, most likely to win. Yeah. <laughs> um, sticking with the, the tribute theme, uh, there was a big weekend in music. Actually, out of Las Vegas this weekend, the Grammys. Who knows what number this is? Probably 50-something, I would assume. I feel like it's always like the 50-something a Grammy. Like, mm-hmm. ever since like 1992, they're like, the 51st Grammy Award! It's like, <laughs> wait, isn't it always the 51st? I don't understand. Um, nobody got slapped, so I don't really care. All that much. Yeah. But my girl Olivia Rodrigo showed up and showed out. She won how many Grammys? Uh, three. Three? Wow. Yeah, they were showing a side by side of uh, Taylor Swift's first year winning Grammys. And they look like mirror images of one another, like similar dress, holding three Grammys in a similar, similar ways. It's like, well, if this is what she has to look forward to, I got to tell you, I'm all in. <laughs> <laughs> Driver's yeah. license, man. What a. <laughs> really yeah. gets you in the feels i know i think every know. man in the house loves that song did you Way ever see the saturday <laughs> live skit no <laughs> it's incredible uh the do you remember the guy who was the lead on bridgerton the first year the guy that looks like conrad you're saying a bunch of stuff that i don't watch. you're the only woman in america who hasn't watched bridgerton. i don't watch normal stuff it's not <laughs> i mean yeah Besides, right, it's like, not normal first of all it's like you know floofy romance novel bullshit oh no that's definitely not me uh, i hate when we had to watch pride and prejudice and read it in mm. english class in high school i i actually yes, verbally yes i verbally times, like yes. rioted against it and i was like what is this chick flick bullshit <laughs> it's not even written well i was like so angsty about it honestly I'm just not just just you can say it on air how big is your dick <laughs> <laughs> if i was a guy i think i'd have eight inch eight inches easily <laughs> So how does this compare to the, uh, to the DM guy? Oh, I don't know. We, I said that I thought that was maybe like nine and you, Guys, you laughed listen, at me. Listen, this guy, this guy had a yardstick between he his didn't legs. He did have to like, he had to like pull his arm down to like get it over the. It literally flopped up, hit him in the chest and then went back down. It and flopped Melissa over goes, his shoulder. I go, how big do you think that was? And she goes, I don't know, like eight, nine inches. I don't I'm just know. Like, eight or nine <laughs> inches. I don't know. I didn't think people had like 12 inches in real life. I, I don't think he has a 12 inch. <laughs> what do you think he is? I think 16? he has a small child between his legs. <laughs> a 22 inch? What's going on? I mean, he made my shoes look small and I wear 13. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it was, was long. It was a real, it was a real moment we shared there. Um, what, what the you and that guy oh, shared a uh, the guy, the guy from Bridgerton. So he hosted Saturday Night Live, and they did this skit where like six, six guys were in a bar shooting pool. Yeah. And uh, the guy's like, hold on a second, let me put on my song. And he goes to the jukebox, and he puts on Driver's License. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're kind of just like bobbing along. And somebody was like, is this Olivia Rodrigo? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And he starts to like spit all these facts about like how she wrote the song and That's everything. You. And then they all just break out in the chorus and start singing That's it That's literally together. like what, when that's like last summer, I, that's how I felt in the house. Like yeah. everyone, that was what everyone was doing. Look, it's, it's a great song. I saw somebody tweet when the album came out. Uh, this girl tweeted something along the lines of, um, I'm going to get a boyfriend and break up with him immediately just so I can feel what she's feeling while I listen to this album. <laughs> Pretty great. Yeah. Which I think, right. uh, I think it's totally reasonable. Um, a little bit of a sad undertone to the Grammys was uh, the Foo Fighters had recently lost their, their drummer, Taylor Hawkins. Uh, and I wasn't that familiar with him prior to him passing. 
which I feel like this happens often whenever you're talking about like high profile uh, bands or actors or whatever. Like I remember the Robin Williams suicide hit me pretty hard because like I was just always a massive fan of his. Mm -hmm. And I thought that like there was always two very clear sides to him between the comedic and the serious. And it was kind of the serious roles that appealed a lot more to me. Uh, or like hit home to me a little bit harder and it makes a lot of sense in the sense that uh, you know that was kind of his tortured side getting put on display a little bit more with like rock stars it's it's always it just depends right so when uh, Chester from Linkin Park and Chris Cornell both committed suicide that was huge because like those were two bands that I listened to very like from start to finish uh, growing up and they were kind of the faces of those said bands but when guitarists or drummers or whatever kind of pass, it's, it's less of a deal, right? Like, this wasn't Kurt Cobain dying. This was closer to, like, you know, Dave Grohl dying back then before he was all that known. But um, with his passing and a little bit of happenstance, uh, just scrolling through my Audible, I was recommended David Grohl's autobiography. And I'm, like, three quarters of the way through now. And, man, it's First of all, it's incredible. Yeah. What a remarkable storyteller he is. He's just like one of the most well-spoken individuals from uh, a vantage point that like you just wouldn't expect that. Because uh, like he's just very self-described as like grunge, punky, uh, kind of anarchist a, a, a bit. He's got a lot of layers to him. A lot of layers, yeah. yeah. But he's also just like a really chill dude who's like a, a dad. And like, I don't know, man. There's just like so much about him that's super likable. Uh, but the way that he speaks and the way that he writes is is also really incredible. But what I'm noticing as I'm getting through the book was the bond between him and Taylor were just, it, it was second to none. And it makes sense, right? Like David Grohl is considered to be one of the best drummers uh, of his generation. And he considers Taylor to the be one of drummer. the best drummers yeah. uh, of, right. of his time too. Uh, and man, this guy, like he was 50 and just looked, he looked 20 years younger than me. Uh, just like remarkable shape. You would have never guessed anything wrong. Died from an, an enlarged heart. Uh, tough to know how much like substance played a role in that. I'm sure it's greater than zero, but I thought, not. They, I thought they, they found a lot of drugs in his system. Right? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, think, uh, I, I know that the actual that cause of did. death was... I, I don't know the details of it, so I'm not going to... Yeah, I know the cause of death was uh, an enlarged heart that led to um, uh, a heart attack or... Or, or something along those lines, but uh, I'm sure drugs played some sort of role over the lifetime mm -hmm. of um, him being around. Uh, but there, were, <laughs> there was a short tribute to him. Uh, I know that Billie Eilish performed, and she did a tribute to him, uh, really like sure. wearing a T-shirt or whatever. Really cool stuff there. Um, and then leading a little bit further into the seriousness, uh, the president of Ukraine. Zelensky. Yeah. I didn't want to pronounce it because I knew I was going to get it wrong. Uh, he, did a, he did a 90 second speech that was pretty heavy. Uh, it's interesting to me. It's interesting to me where this fits into pop culture, I guess, because that's what the Grammys mm -hmm. are to me, right? right? It's pop culture. But, you know, if we're being clear, uh, most revolutions that have occurred throughout the history of America have been heavily interwoven with our pop culture. So it's not that shocking to me, I guess, to see the Grammys uh, kind of give him a platform. But it is a little bit interesting. I guess maybe like there's just no divide as far as like what side's the right side in this particular instance. There probably isn't much in the way of Americans on the side of Putin. Yeah. Um, I think it's like 5%, which is like, who are those 5%? Right. <laughs> right. Well, there's a right. lot of uh, Cameron? sort of on that conspiracy side of things, like... There's people who are siding with Putin, sort of like from what I've the, I've glanced because I I, I would take, take a dip into conspiracy t Twitter every now. And you? Then. You know, I, I mean, <laughs> no I gotta way. I gotta keep up with the tattoo. That. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I just like to know what 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 are people talking? about? What's the tea? So um, apparently, there's like on a, sort of like alt right type platforms are talking about how it's suspicious that everyone is so united and all of the like media is pushing a certain narrative and whatever but it's sort of like i don't know it's hard to 
they're just they're sort of spreading Russian propaganda basically is was what I'm seeing sure mm-hmm. but I don't know much about it that's just you know I like to keep a, I try to keep a balance balance perspective into the the crazy minds of Americans respect to that um yeah I, I think his speech was really well delivered uh I think that the message was abundantly clear uh I, why don't we just take a look at it and you guys can kind of yeah. give your thoughts more opposite to music. The silence of ruined cities and killed people. Our children draw swooping rockets, not shooting stars. Over 400 children have been injured and 153 children died and we'll never see them drawing. Our parents are happy to wake up in the morning in bomb shelters, but alive. Our loved ones don't know if we will be together again. The world doesn't let us choose who survives and who stays in internal silence. Our musicians wear body armor instead of tuxedo. They sing to the wounded in hospitals, even to those who can't hear them. But the music will break through anyway. We defend our freedom to live, to love, to sound. On our land, we are fighting Russia, which brings horrible silence with its bombs. The dead silence. Fill the silence with your music. Fill it today to tell our story. Tell the truth about the war. On your social networks, on TV, support us in any way you can, any but not silence. And then peace will come. To all our cities, the war is destroying. Chernigiv, Kharkiv, Volnovakha, Mariupol, and others, they are legends already, but I have a dream of them living and free, free, like you on the Grand Day. First of all, how flooded are the basements? of women across America who were watching the Grammys at that exact moment. I, I almost wonder if it's one of those things like, I have this theory that there's a certain celebrities that more men have a crush on than women, one of, being, one of which is Leonardo DiCaprio. I feel like more, at Matthew McConaughey is like the king of this. I feel like more men have a crush on him than women do. No way. <laughs> Matthew McConaughey's book. Matthew is McConaughey. McConaughey. So I, I, I feel like, him. yes. I, he is the <laughs> fucking dream. Yeah. There you go. You're just, you're just you're making a point. proving my point. Yeah. I think. He's such a dude. He, yes. He, men have a crush on him. Women probably do too, but more men do than women <laughs> uh, by a lot. <laughs> He's a great person to aspire to. Uh, no, well, and yeah, and Zelensky sure. here is just like... No, but he, he, a lot of women like him, yeah. Of course, he's yeah, like the maybe. manliest man of all time. He just shows up with this gr- like grizzled voice of like, Hello, America. But you know, like he's... Well, he obviously, he understands pop culture. You know, you're saying about the grand yeah. being pop culture. He seems like he's yeah. on the younger side of things. Well, like, uh, you know, he, he was in pop culture in ukraine like he was right. on tv he was a comedian, comedian. he was in on tv mm-hmm. and, and so like i think he he understands that world and so like he's he it makes sense that he would go on something like the grammys to appeal to the american people to plead to the american people because he wants america to do you know he wants them to do more than what we're doing now which you know obviously is it, it's pretty tough it's it's hard for us to do more without crossing that line where we're now in a war with Russia. Yeah, that so kind of like, speaks to like the bigger purpose of like what what is the what's he hoping to accomplish with this message? Kind yeah, of I mean, I I think it's I think it's you know, he, in his eyes, he thinks well, if the more Americans I can get on my side and, and feel sympathy for me, then maybe they can push their president, you know, Biden, to 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 do more to you know establish a no fly zone or something like that. But like, I. I don't think it will. I don't think it will work, but I think that's where he's coming from because he's very desperate right now. Right, his 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 country is being destroyed day in and day out. A lot of people are dying. So all I'm thinking is the Grammys just using him to bump their ratings up because no one watches anymore. Oh, that well, yeah, the Grammys might be doing that as well. But you have to understand though, a lot of the reason why nobody watches is because you can just catch the snippets in it like at a later date so, i literally watched I, the entire I, grammys in pre-production and it took it took me like 18 minutes so i watched most of the grammys last night i was you know back and forth but like um what i think i like about the grammys now compared to maybe a few not too many years ago but it it's a lot of performances 
It is mostly yeah. just, it's like they give away, like they show way more or way less awards than they used to. Before it was like award after award after award and then a, and then a, and then a, and then a per performance and then a bunch of awards and then a performance. Now it's the opposite. Or it's just performance after performance after performance and then they throw in an award here and there. And well, I like, also think it's kind of like speaks to uh, the, the dilution of the award itself. There used to be a very strict number of categories and uh, winning them had a certain level of prestige because the competition was very heavy, mm -hmm. right? But that started to break whenever Eminem rose onto the scene because they like didn't have a category yeah. for rap for a very, very, very long time. And I think they finally like began to develop one, but that opened the dam now where it was just like, okay, music's really tough to just like pigeonhole into a specific category. And there are just like a lot of crossover artists and a lot of blending mm -hmm. and melding taking place. So now I think that they probably went to the other extreme where like there's just awards for awards for awards. Kind of like the WSOP. A little bit. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, well, I mean it's the just same so award. Many, just, no, but there's just so many more bracelets now than there was. So it's yeah. diluted. Uh, Yo, yeah. Do you guys believe that Snoop Dogg has never won a Grammy? What? What? No, I believe that. Yeah, no, you're because right. we because, just said there wasn't right, a rap Grammy yeah, until Eminem. That's well, like no, ten years like, after Snoop's yeah. prime. Wasn't the first? Didn't uh, Will Smith and DJ Jazzy Jeff? They won the first rap. Oh, I don't know if it was rap. One. I think it was. They won a Grammy. Yeah, it was like the first rap. The fir first, the first time they actually added a, a rap category, they won it. But then did they remove it? Which was like it? early '90s. Yeah, but then did they remove it thereafter? Because something tells me that. Tupac and Dre and Biggie and those guys weren't winning Grammys in the mid '90s. Actually, I know for a fact they weren't. I, I, yeah, I don't know. My best guess know. is like either they fitted in under another category, or it was just like a one-off that year, and then there was a big stretch where there was no rap category. But like the gangster rap era definitely was not pulling in awards. Yeah, at least not outside of you know the BET yeah. awards and they were all the going to people awards. like uh, Will Smith, right? <laughs> and and. Who would have known? Imagine, he would have imagine been like, the one that the, the violent one that they were trying to like avoid. Well, he didn't kill Chris Rock. He <laughs> opened hand slapped him. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I, I do think that they're they're a lot more focused on performance now, which is great. Obviously, it's it's the best way to showcase the artist. It really uh, is. I was a little disappointed in the in the um, tribute to Taylor. I thought that they could have done a little bit more. Maybe that's just me like finding an interest in him now and wanting to just like see a better portrayal mm -hmm. of like how big of a deal he was to the Foo Fighters. Uh, and more importantly, just like it's an opportunity to showcase the band as a whole. Like, I don't think, I think maybe we're still too a little bit like our generation is still a little too close to it. And then the next generation is too removed from it because they hit that like sweet spot where they like, we literally grew up with the Foo Fighters, right? Right. Like they're one to one with our generation. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're not, they haven't aged out yet to a point. Like, they're still putting out albums. Yeah. So we're not really that reflective. But they're going to go down easily as one of the three best bands in our lifetime. For sure. And it's not even remotely close. Right. And, you know, part of, of the construction of that band is the former drummer of Nirvana, who was perceived to be, like, one of the best of all time, who then became a lead man and found another drummer that's perceived to be one of the best of all time, a part of one of the best bands yeah. uh, of an era, yeah. right? So it's just like, for me, it was like, uh, when people die in those situations, it's, it's, it seems like a good opportunity to really highlight all of the accolades and just how important the story was as a whole. And maybe it's not on the Grammys. And Taylor right? Hawkins, he was, um, he, he was uh, Lance Morissette's yeah, that's uh, where drummer. He was yeah, at, at yeah. Like, her height. Like, and she went on like this, What's like... Smart? month and a, or a year and a half tour like he, 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 he was, was the, the touring guy. drummer right, so he yeah. actually wasn't a part of her band well yeah i guess i mean she didn't have a band right it's just when but she, no, goes she on did tour. have a band but like they, they, but yeah she had a band but i mean it's like it's a lance Moore set but this is her band that plays no no what her. i'm saying is like he was the touring drummer so it's like he's not recording in the studio no i think he was uh maybe maybe i'm wrong i, yeah, I mean from what i understand lately uh yeah. or like what i've been going down the rabbit hole and uh, I think that was the case, but either way, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, obviously like he was perceived to be very good, mm -hmm. uh, like out of the gate. And then it was very clear from that point forward. Uh, I watched a Howard Stern interview yesterday where this must've been, I think it was like 2013. It was right after one of the Foo Fighters recent album releases. Uh, 
Dave Grohl and Taylor were in studio at uh, for Howard Stern, and somehow they got on the conversation of like um, the band splitting up or whatever. And Dave Grohl was like adamant that he would never kick Taylor Hawkins out of the out of the band, and. Uh, you know, Howard Stern obviously pushed back. And he's like, I'll tell you what, I will give you $10,000 cash if I ever kick him out of the band. And Taylor goes, that's it? And he goes, $20,000 cash. $25,000 cash if I ever kick him out of the band. So it was like very clear uh, like what their relationship was. And yeah. I mean, these stories are very interesting to me um, as, as an onlooker, as a fan. Uh, and again, like, you know, when we're talking about creating narratives and really sinking the hooks uh, of the audience in this is how it's done right it's it's done by making it somewhat personal um and like feeling like you get to know the talent to some degree uh i know that like landon had been in the chat yesterday we were talking about we were somehow always talking about poker's marketing problem yes <laughs> but uh we were, we were back on that subject and um he and melissa were kind of like comparing it to esports and we were like sharing clips and things like that where uh, it, it's kind of demonstrating how in the esports world you can get a little bit hooked on uh, the team element of it. Uh, and my pushback was just like, yeah, that's true. But like the real narrative driven hook is the actual gameplay and the visuals and things like that. Um, but there are a lot of derivatives that still have huge followings that aren't very visual, like Magic the Gathering or chess, for example. Um, so it's not like it's impossible. I just think like we haven't really found a way to bridge that gap yet and take a bunch of nerdy 30 something white males that uh, are heavily exclusive when it comes to knowledge of the game and make it much more inclusive to the audience. Cause I think like ultimately that's what it hinges on, right? Is that we shun so much people who don't understand the game to our depths that it's very alienating. It's like, <laughs> half pot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, what, did you just start at your kitchen table last <laughs> week, bro? <laughs> you ever even open a sim? Just like, okay, like we've, we've lost the crowd. <laughs> right. It's over. Um, on that topic, though, uh, Triton Poker has come back with a bang. It's been, wow. I think, 31 months since they've been able to run an event. So Cyprus. just shy of three years since the last Triton Poker High Roller event. This is in Cyprus, uh, and it seems like it's a dual event. So the first to the sixth is a bunch of 25K to 100K buy-ins, I believe. And then the seventh to the 14th is Poker Go's Super High Roller Bowl series, which culminates in a 250K Super High Roller Bowl buy-in, um, and it's surrounded by a bunch of... Uh, 25 through 100k events as well so it looks like it's about two full weeks of a high right. roller series uh just kicked yeah. off over the yeah. weekend Seems the first event even that included like complicated but a little post flop a little blind versus right. blind that's all right wide uh the first event concluded yesterday um i believe i don't know any of the three i, I don't know any of the three in the i don't know any of the top three but it was a uh, pretty star-studded final table. Um, we saw Ivy get fourth, Jason Kuhn get fifth, uh, Elton Sang, who is a regular on these Triton tours, got sixth. Chidwick, obviously, we know seventh. Greenwood, eighth. Um, Soiza, I'm not very familiar with, but I recognize the name. Uh, and then Adamo obviously rounding it out in 11th. The top three, two Hungarians get first and second. Andres Nemeth and Laszlo Budhas. We'll, we'll pretend like I got that <laughs> not too butchered. Uh, congratulations to them. Uh, it's, it's good to see some new faces from some countries that we don't really see represented all that often. I don't think Hungary is very big in the uh, high roller, no limit scene these days. At least as far we as... We got some new countries in the high rollers. Hungary, Japan. Yeah. Well, Japan's like... Uh, at least... He, oh, it's strange, though. Like, America has to be a lot further of a trek than Cyprus, right? Maybe not. Uh, 
Probably, yeah. No, it has to be, right? It's the exact opposite yeah. side of the world. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's definitely really far. Uh, I wonder if they're there and like just we didn't hear anything from them in the first event. I mean, I imagine they had a lot of success here, so it's like I yeah. can't imagine that they just Let's flew straight it. back home yeah. to Japan. Uh, maybe though, wouldn't be out of this out of the question. Today sure. was a uh, hundred k uh, eight max. Oh, first first of all, the fifty k six max, like it got a lot of players. I think it got eighty players, four million in the prize pool. That's a lot for a fifty k in general. Um, but especially for the six max format, people love it. Today's 100k eight max, uh, they're down to the final five. Uh, I believe nine cashed, and we see uh, just within the money, Vogelsang and Ali Izmirovic. And now with five remaining, uh, Mike Watson is fifth in chips with 19 bigs, Jake Schindler fourth in chips, uh, Tom Vogelsang not to be confused with Kristoff, is third in chips. Uh, so Tom Vogelsang and Tuan Mulder, both French, also, or sorry, both Netherlands, uh, also two players I'm not familiar with, but uh, given that they're from the Netherlands, I assume that they're big online guys. Uh, and then Daniel Devoris, obviously massive crusher. He's been on the high roller scene for quite some time. He's chip leading with a whopping... 25 big blinds. Oh my goodness. So it is <laughs> literally anybody's game right now. Uh, last like in chips, hyper. 19 bigs. Chip leader, 25 bigs. This is this is the ICM wet dream we've all been dreaming of. <laughs> Casual, yeah, 100K, good. you know, 25 big blind chip leader. Yeah, pretty <laughs> wild. Uh, the payouts are, are steep enough for it to matter too. Uh, mm -hmm. So fifth is 500K, sixth is 680. Or sorry, fourth is, is 680. Structure? Why is it so shallow? Um, no, it's not bad. It's that the skill just is just so playing, high. If they've been playing, like, it's just going a long time. So well, they just get so, like, I think that this collective group is just getting so much better at ICM that there are very few egregious errors being made once once the money bubble bursts. Yeah. So and also on the money bubble, on right? longer. If I had to guess, and this is my experience playing, ha having played exactly three high rollers ever, but if I had to guess, the bubble probably took quite some time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know the super high roller bowl in 16, whenever I final tabled, the bubble was agonizing. Oh, it was so, it was, I, I didn't think it was ever going to end. I had the worst seat draw possible. And I was just like, I'm going to fucking bubble this. Like there's a chip leader to your left or something. No, well, yeah. So to my left was, um, to my immediate left was, was Rainer on my immediate left or two to my left? I think he was, he was my immediate left, then Bryn Kenny, then Dan Smith. And they were, they were two, three, one oh, in good. chips. Yeah. And then to my immediate right was Helmuth, who was last in chips mm -hmm. and is just uber fucking nitty. You uh, just have to wait. <laughs> right. To his right is Dan Shack, who's relatively short and also playing like incredibly tight. Mm -hmm. And then Seidel, who's just like, you know, a goat and never going to make any mistakes. And it's just like, how am I? I have no reshove spots because these three are short and play like relatively snug. Yeah. And then to my left are three absolute killers with all the chips who are just going to continually pummel me. Yes. So like, what am I supposed to do? Sit, uh, sit lucky for hands. me, Cowboy Dan got set over set. Yeah. <laughs> and he took one for the team. He took one for the team. <laughs> that was really that was really torturous too, though, because uh, so he got set over set versus Rainer in a button versus big blind scenario. And it left Dan with like six big blinds. Mm -hmm. And God damn it, if he didn't play those six big blinds as tough as he possibly could. Uh, oh, Fedor was in the in between all this. So sorry, it was... Uh, it was so ca easy table, yeah, casual. Easy simple, table. really. Yeah. Uh, so it was Rainer, Bryn, Dan, Fedor, Seidel, Shaq, Helmuth, me. Mm. So it's like, sure, of all the... like. Of the weakest players at the table, I have Helmuth and Shaq to my right, and that's great. But they have no chips. They're never going to get a spot to yeah. open. Literally, it'll never fold to them. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, what good does that do me? <laughs> and like, anytime that it actually may fold to me, which is pretty improbable, I'm going to have to deal with like Rainer, Bryn, and Dan in the blinds. And it's just like, okay, I'm never getting one through. Yeah. It folded to me once in the cutoff, and I had ace, queen off, and 18 bigs. And, you know, this is 2016 too, so it's just like... Uh, it, it's it's an especially awkward spot because we were still open jamming like 15 bigs back then. Right. Uh, and I'm just like, with ICM, this is fucking awful. Like this hand is worth so much to me mm -hmm. because I need chips and this is the best hand I've been dealt in days. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same token, it's like, if I min raise here, I'm just fucked. 
Because, like, if I get jammed on, this is probably an ICM fold, and I'm certainly not going to make it. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, if we just see I a can't say I'd make it either. Right. To be right. It's just like, and if we just see a <laughs> flop. Show me the Ace 5. <laughs> yeah. It's like, if we just see a flop, what edge do I ever have here? I'm next to last in chips. They have a ton of ICM pressure. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I'm limping. I'm fucking limping. I don't care. And I limp. <laughs> Rainer folds the button, Bryn completes the small, and Dan 5Xs from the big. And I was just like, gulp. All in. <laughs> Luckily, he had King Queen, found the fold, okay. and uh, then got set of resets. So well fuck that guy. Well. Yeah. <laughs> pickleball Dan, you know? He, he retired and took up pickleball yeah. like the rest of us. Pro pickleballer. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that, like, you know, they're all just playing so incredibly well whenever it comes to big money decisions that we don't really see deep stack play any longer at the final. It's not like the WPTs, mm -hmm. right? And this is no knock to the WPTs. It's, it's why I still play them because I can still have an edge having not studied well, tournaments in four years. Well, also it's a huge years. difference between like a 3,500 and a 100K buy-in. Yeah, that's, that's relatively true. But if we took the same group and put them in a closed 5K, yeah. I think you would see the same result at right. the final table because they're just playing so correctly. Yeah. But like when you have an open field 3,500, you just see the chip leader with like 80 or 90 bigs at the final table. And, you know, last in chips is like 25 bigs. It's yeah. because the structure is slow enough and the play is bad enough. Right. That the good players are able to accumulate well beyond the speed of the structure. Mm -hmm. And you're just seeing like big mistakes being made by relatively recreational players. You know, mistakes that are worth 10 or 15 big blinds uh extrapolated out over like 10 or 15 big blinds per hundred mm -hmm. and then on top of that they're icm errors too so like they're actually costing them hundreds or thousands of dollars in, yeah. in scenarios where they're making them uh i think that's why we see guys like uh altman and elias just dominate these fucking fields right where uh and this is no knock to either of them but i, I think that they would agree they're not like favorites in a high roller Right, it's it's a totally different skill set. Yeah, and to the same end, I would take Elias or Altman in an open thirty five hundred over some high rollers that I know have a pretty big uh, win rate. Right, mm -hmm. and it's not a knock against them. It's just that they're not they're leaving money on the table by not exploiting the bad. Play. Yeah, and also like just knowing the pool is worth so much too. Like yeah. just having all that experience against right. the same pool. I think Izmirovich is a good crossover example of somebody who just knows how to redline. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, again, that's no knock against everybody else who plays high rollers. But when he plays smaller, he plays like a person who's playing smaller. <laughs> right. And it's just like boomer bust kind of mentality. And I think in those big open fields, that's actually a reasonable approach. Yeah. You know, you're not trying to just like well, limp your way through. If you're going to rebuy unlimited, like try yeah. and spin up the stack early yeah. on and then you have a, an advantage. And he's had pretty reasonable success uh, doing exactly that. Yeah. So yeah, pretty exciting to see uh, the Triton Tour back. Uh, I, I'm pumped. I'm hoping anyway that we're going to get to see some televised cash games out of them. I always find those to be like so enthralling mm -hmm. um we're missing some of the characters I, I don't think guys like jrb and robo have traveled for this so much has changed in three years right like both of them are parents now uh jrb just had his third kid robo had a kid he got married it's just like so much in that dynamic well, maybe has, we see some new new blood faces <laughs> changing of the guard yeah but do we want to see new faces I mean, do you just want everyone to die off? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not that. It's just, uh, I think the reason why we see what we see with like high, uh, high stakes poker and these other curated lineups, I think the reason why you see it being leaning towards old guard is because they do play a little bit more unhinged. Like, yeah. all right, yeah, sure, we'll get some new faces, but are they just going to stuff it all in pre with 5-4 suited? Right. No, but JRB will. That's true. Right? That's true. It was just like, you know, I, I want to see well, pain. Well, they, they could be, you know, we just need some wild cards. Some yeah. Wild new faces. Change it's hard. Up. What? Change the game up. Changing the game, game up. At changing the game up turns it into what Landon... It's so funny that the younger kids now are more purist than the older generation. Right? It's, it's, uh, it's interesting to me. Like, when Landon watches poker, he's annoyed at like how Everything. badly everybody's playing, <laughs> technically speaking. Like it just drives him insane to see some Gigawell punt off 
in a spot where it's like I'm licking my chops. I'm just like, God, I know, poker's alive and well. I feel like I relate to your reaction more because I'm just like, love this guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's yeah, go. Yeah. Fat like, situation. Yeah, let's fucking let's go, go, baby. Love this guy. Of King High. I, I, they become it. my favorites. Like well, I love just wants that. Everybody to play perfect. At all times. It's so boring. You don't want to watch no, of just course perfect. Not. It, like that. I want to see some someone do some weird shit and like yeah. flop the nuts in a really annoying yeah. way versus someone else. Oh, yeah, like he had a boner for four days after that Sean Winter bluff with A6. He was just like, God, <laughs> God damn it, man. That is that is good looking poker right there. I mean, I would fuck that kind of poker. I, I would make out with it in a hallway. Like that is the kind of poker. I have trouble I'm after. imagining him saying any of this. No, literally verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about a girl. When that you're not way, here but... to defend yourself, I get to put words in your yeah. mouth. Yeah. All right, let's do chin next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, last note. Somehow we're still on the news and notes. By the way, it's a good thing we didn't actually build a real show. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the last thing that's noteworthy for the weekend, it's the biggest thing, was the uh, acquisition of a small piece of Twitter by Elon Musk. Big piece. Yeah, it's weird. Nine percent, man. That's nine, not small. Nine percent feels lot. so small, for but it's obviously person, massive. It's ma What's that? For three, one person who isn't worth. part of the company, that's huge. No, no, yeah. no, I agree. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm used to. Like if I was selling a piece to a tournament, nine percent is yeah, spit in the mean, face. <laughs> yeah, it's right? not it's just like, what the fuck am I gonna do with nine percent? It's the whole company. Yeah, um, but yeah, what with a three billion dollar acquisition? Just under, yeah. Twitter is valued at thirty billion. That's pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Thirty billion. I mean, I, that's not. That's, if anything, that's not, that's, like, like, these companies now are worth so much. Like Tesla is worth one point one trillion dollars. Yeah. And it's never had a positive year. Right. I That's can relate. Hey, yeah. solve for why. <laughs> we we are just breaking even year over year, but we're growing year over year. I, I'd say our valuation is somewhere in the neighborhood of ten million. Yeah, it has to be. It has to be. I mean, you know, it's only a million or billion. Well, million. I, I'm trying to be, you know. He's being humble. Diplomatic. Yeah, <laughs> got to be humble a little bit. But oh no, I just left. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's crazy because like um, last week he he put up that that poll uh, on Twitter asking if Twitter was you know. Uh, adhered to you know the free speech uh, laws, and seventy percent of the people said no. And then he said he also put a disclaimer underneath it and said, uh, "Vote carefully because it may have consequences." I'm just wondering what his MO then, is then, here. Then, yeah, then he just buys Curious three billion dollars worth. I mean, clearly there's a strategy. There here. has to be some sort of plan, some sort of strategy. I don't. I mean, I'm not going to try to get into the mind of Elon Musk because. Maybe he's just gonna go in and kill everyone that what, in Twitter. What are people of the impression? <laughs> what are people of the impression should be different on Twitter? Like, if seventy percent of people are saying it doesn't adhere to free speech, first of all, it doesn't have to because it's a private entity. But right. that aside, it, yeah, but it, it is a private entity. But it, I mean, is this all predicated on Trump being banned? It's also not. No, like, if Trump's unbanned, yeah, is may, it suddenly? Maybe that probably has a a little bit to do with it, and also people are always complaining about getting shadow banned and whatnot, but also like expecting a company that operates worldwide to adhere to American. I mean, it's just like, that's a very Americanized way of looking at it. Is it not to be like, Oh, it's free speech. And I mean, it is an American company, but it's well, I like guess, global. I guess my thing is like, what exactly is being restricted at this current point that I mean, people get banned for saying like death threats. I don't know what people want to say. That's, I don't think slander is protected well, they, by they did, free they speech. They do a lot of, um, I mean, it just, it seems like they're quick to be the authority on what is true, what isn't true, yeah. that kind of stuff. And then, it, so it's like, you might say something and they're, they'll like ban you or, or flag your account. And then, because they think it's untrue. And then like, it comes out like two months later that what you were saying was factual. So like, yeah. It, I think it's a it's a slippery slope when you start saying we're going to determine what's what's right what's right. So what's are, misinformation. Are you more okay with it being a third party like Snopes, kind of being programmed into no, the platform? I would rather it just be like no. open. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, don't you think you can attribute free market to this. There's you, you, there's so much misinformation. You have right, exactly. That, that, that's the thing. There there is misinformation. That's a problem. There is you you can't just have people going on their, you know. Uh, 
you know, making death threats or, or doing <laughs> or doing things that are going to cause violence or, or those kind of things. So, like, it has to be, I guess, regulated at some point. But, like, I know you say that it's, um, you know, it's a it's a private company, so they can do what they want. They can ban who they want. But, like, I, I, I think we got to start looking at these companies, Twitter, YouTube, as more like public utilities, right? Because it's, it's just, they're yeah. so big and, sort of and, like, and, and like yeah, so, like, I think that, that, you shouldn't be able to just, you know, give like at the top can just say you're you're you're. Well, good that kind of goes not. against our framework, though. I feel like right, like if if we suddenly start taking the power out of private entities while they're still private, that kind of just goes against everything that America stands for. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just too much. Uh, authority to give like an, a single entity I, I can agree with that i could see an argument for imparting regulation on them mm -hmm. um that doesn't necessarily cut their legs out from underneath them to make final decisions but instead uh i guess forces them through some sort of due process uh like i think a third party entity be it snopes or or something else that's curated that does the fact checking uh, I think that that's a nice happy medium. And it's, yeah, like it's, linking, you could link them somehow. Yeah, or, yeah. I mean, uh, I don't know exactly how Snopes operates, but like, let's assume that it's an algorithm that just scans. I'm not, yeah, I'm not mad about an objective third party entity. A lot of people are though, because that's similar then, to what Instagram does, right? Is, like, they'll put warnings yeah. on that say like, this yeah, contains COVID nineteen right. information that well, may not be accurate. Well, that's a little bit. Is are they using like like where's that I don't know. From? I don't know exactly what like they're using. I feel like people don't like it because one Zuckerberg is sus. Sure, for sure. And alien, and yeah. it's probably like reptilian and then <laughs> <laughs> and also like facebook instagram like they're they've both had extremely uh questionable practices and in, in the way that they're amplifying it, people's own biases and echo right. chambers well and they, sort they of, had the whole know, russian yeah yeah thing. like there's just a lot and it's like we don't really want you telling us what's factual i think it might be more to do with like facebook as an entity whereas twitter it doesn't seem like has had besides the banning Donald Trump. Yeah, I guess had. like where where does um So I'm not I'm not sure if these are private or public entities, but like something like the New York Times, is that a privately owned company or public? Yeah, I, they're mostly private. private. Like Bloomberg yeah, owns I would assume they're, they're yeah. private. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So like something like that. They're they're obviously governed by a certain set of rules and standards that they have to adhere to, right? right. Otherwise it's malpractice. Yeah. So maybe perhaps we can treat these sort of closer to a journalistic outlet it's like how are you supposed to um it's just so many people to monitor i mean it's like this is an open forum it's not like you have like a team of journalists writing you have like it's just dead well, i'm not saying that say we should whatever. be held to the standard of journalism yeah. of course that's that's ridiculous <laughs> right. uh that we be should crazy. be allowed to gossip freely in a public space yeah but what I am saying, I guess, and I, I imagine this is just handled by machine learning and algorithms and things of that nature, is curbing the misinformation in some way, shape, or form um, and having some sort of methodology to deplatform dangerous people. So I, I actually like the way Twitter does this because when you look it, go, it goes into the more reply section like mm -hmm. you have to click to open it and the and i think it seems like the way that they judge who's going into that section is based on like how spammy are they mm -hmm. are they posting how how many times are they posting like repetitively insulting or like you know disparaging right. things and like it, it it seems like it's pretty good like usually whenever i click there and i see it's all like assholes replying in that section yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. it's fine like I mean, you can still look at it if you want like, but it's yeah, not like right with... out in the open yeah, yeah i guess that makes me makes me wonder then returning back to the original question of like what exactly about the platform currently is not allowing for free speech and i think it's more so just the extreme cases right people like david duke and donald trump being deplatformed uh not given this amplified voice and to your point, like, that's exactly what this is. Like, losing your privileges on Twitter or YouTube really does cut you off from the rest of the world if mm -hmm. you're somebody with a platform. Right. And then it does also crop up these secondary markets, if you will, like 4chan and, uh, you know, whatever the, the dark the version of Reddit is. For, Trump just launched for one. For it was, like, called Truth or something. I think it, like, completely Maybe there was another one before it, too. 
uh, I, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like strictly for uh, like uh, alt right. People do Telegram groups and stuff. Yeah, that's fine one time though. I like those are small. One and I was like scared. Like I was like, never mind. <laughs> that reminds me. I I watched a um a documentary that I know you at least started to watch. Uh called don't trust or trust no one mm -hmm. uh finding the bitcoin kingpin or yeah. whatever and it was about this guy who developed a bitcoin uh trading platform in canada where they had lacked one what was the name of it quadrigo quadrigo yeah uh and effectively it appeared to be a ponzi and it appeared he faked his death as an exit scam but uh I don't want. I don't want to ruin it for anybody yeah, else no, who's going to watch it or seen whatever. Yeah, no, because I haven't either. So I definitely um, want to watch it. But no spoilers, Burke. The the long and short of it is that uh, a lot of the story was fleshed out in Telegram groups by internet sleuths who were conned by this man. Gotta love those internet sleuths. Right, like it, it reminds me of the documentary "Don't Fuck with Cats." Yeah, oh, that is so good. Well, because man. it's really it. people like uniting good, from all over against like this common enemy, and it's it, I don't know. There's something very. It's fun also about just that. like it, it's also kind of like terrifying in the paper trail that like we admit, uh, like our technological footprint is just so, so traceable. Yeah, I mean they can build an AI based on like your Twitter, right, and like just have it be you living on forever. I can't wait till I get deep faked. God, I hope he's cooler than me. Your or... Twitter wouldn't be inaccurate. Like, if they based it on your Twitter, though, it wouldn't be, like, the person that they, the AI that they built. It would be what everybody thinks of. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be accurate at all. I mean, it would be, it would be some pseudo Mine smart person that accurate. everybody thinks I am and some it, asshole. Get this guy out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm here for it. I, I would love to meet my deep fake. I think that yeah. he would be a real fucking treat. Yeah. Just watching Maybe friends that, all day I'll long. I'll end up with my deep fake. <laughs> Oh man. Um Oh wait, we forgot one piece of news. Which is? It's similar to the scamming thing, but uh the guy with the, the silver Mr. Silverman won the oh. MSPT and is now agreeing to pay people back after the silver debacle. Well, allegedly. Sort of. Allegedly. Allegedly cuz apparently Ari sort put out a tweet um Ari Angle put out a tweet, I think it was yesterday, saying that he was playing um yeah, high low, yeah, yeah. high low with uh, like he was using other people's money, right? And then he hasn't made his. He debts was playing right like he was playing with other people's money. Yeah. How, <laughs> do we know how much how much was uh, shorted in the prize? I, I, I don't know. Like fifty k. Fifty k, I think, is outstanding. That's yeah. it. Yeah. He just won one hundred ninety thousand. Yeah. What's the problem? Probably. <laughs> uh, I I'm not maybe great owed, at math maybe he owed by people? any stretch, but I think fifty. Divided by 190. It's been like 22 months or something, 17 months, something like that. At least, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Well, toddlers have aged. Since, <laughs> since this Honestly, happened. what a genius rug. Is it? It is. I uh, don't know. Well, I mean. It seems the, like so no, 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 much no. Sorry. Work. The details of how he went about rugging, terrible. Yeah. But genius to rug low to mid stakes players. Mm, because right, they just have no platform to yeah. amplify. Can you explain what, what actually happened? Uh, so I, I guess it was like a year and a half ago or so, they started a new poker tour, which by the way, everybody should be sus when a new poker tour crops up. Because it's not as fucking easy as just like coming up with a name, Basically, getting some dealers together. It was like together. the fire festival of poker tours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, except like <laughs> way smaller. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's it, poker tours are not as simple as just coming up with a catchy name, getting a bunch of dealers and securing a venue. Like mm -hmm. that is not a tour. That's a potential event, and it's also a potential uh, rug opportunity. Yeah. So uh, I think it was called like the Midway Tour Midway or, or something. Midway Poker Tour. Something like that, yeah. And I don't know exactly where it was. It's somewhere in one of the flyover states, yes, as you would say. Yes, correct. Uh, perhaps Milwaukee. Oh, Illinois. Oh, is it? Yeah. So there was a lot. It's log. funny. I almost said Chicago, but I didn't think it was. I think it was in Chicago. Okay, that makes sense, though, because uh, Chicago, everybody Midway in Chicago Classic. actually goes to either... Um, Milwaukee or like they go Potawa, Potawam, Potawam, Pot, Potawam, something. Yeah. Potawami. <laughs> um, I think they all gamble there. But anyway, I guess that there was some law, law where nobody could be paid out more than five hundred dollars cash. Right. So the way he structured it, and I don't know that this was told to people prior. <laughs> Imagine. I think I, it sounded like from what I read, this happened like the morning of. Yeah, it's not like he just he found just out about this rule. Right. It was like oh he bought shit. Bought a bunch of silver. Right. So. <laughs> 
apparently uh, the loophole in the law was that they were able to give away precious metals. And so <laughs> allegedly he bought a prize pool worth of silver at like a 30% but paid markup, 30% allegedly. markup, which obviously <laughs> just broke him. Yeah. And instead of like partial payments, he was just like, well, what's the difference at this point? Yeah. He's just like, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And just like, and also they had to go to a different location to, to sell the silver. Right. And, and then they're also probably selling at a discount. He bought, I mean, he paid 30% markup probably because you just can't just get your hands on that amount of silver so quickly. Right. Could you imagine? <laughs> the liquidity like, of the, the silver market in yeah. Illinois is. Can't be great. Could good. you imagine winning the tournament and a guy comes up with you? up to you with like a bag of just silver and just plops it on the table and it's like hey, here's your I prize. Mean, That'd I be guess... a lot better than a guy coming up to you and saying all right all right look I know you just won this thing <laughs> but we don't have any cash yeah. so so here's five hundred dollars and a bag of coins right so the best I can do for you at this time is five hundred dollars cash a silver dollar uh-huh and a giant IOU that right. I promise will get fulfilled. Did they not have used Bitcoin or something? Or you would think that would be the logical fucking explanation, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. okay, so what silver? what's the difference between precious metals silver. and virtual metals? Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, you can First sell, off, let's get past sell virtual this law silver. Much and easier. Can we please just pay out cash? Well, I mean, what are you gonna do? Like, state by state, there's a problem. But like, how the fuck did you get to the point of actually securing a venue? And getting to the point yeah. of shuffle up and deal That's absurd. without understanding that like you can't pay out. Right. Yeah. And also like at that point, <laughs> if you're stuck with the choice of, okay, I have to pay these people illegally and face a problem with that mm -hmm. or go pay 30% markup for precious metals uh, of which I can't afford. Right. The former seems like the better thing to deal with. Like, what's going to happen? You're going to get fined? Just you're not, not going to face jail time. Like, it's not... Like, that would have been a way easier workaround than going into a weird silver dealer and buying bags I, of silver. I will say, <laughs> and this is no slight against the people who get fucked in these spots, but these are not criminal masterminds right. that are no. running these organizations. No. Like... Not for nothing. This guy was probably... Um, he was he didn't int intend to do wrong here, probably. There's a good Who chance. He, there's a good chance he did not. Who knows? What, what we, don't know. we don't know. But what? I'm just saying, there's okay, a good well, chance at the beginning of that morning he did not intend to do anything. Okay, wrong. but then why hasn't he made it whole yeah. after he just won four X? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, so it's hard to believe that there wasn't at least I don't know. Maybe maybe he didn't have. But also, I want to know if there was any of. Any other tournaments in life played in Chicago with people getting paid out cash? I've, right. I'm, a, I'm wondering about that. Do they just not have tournaments there? Or? No, they don't. They, they go to Potawatomi okay. and, uh, right. and Milwaukee. <laughs> they go to the <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the thing is, is that uh, I don't know what he stood to gain from running it to begin with. So it's really hard to know how evil his intentions were. Right. Like right. the way I understand it was framed as a charity event. So like the idea is he probably wasn't making any money anyway. And the cost of organizing the event had to be coming from somewhere. I assume uh, the way these things usually work is the charity is like a shelter for profits. Yeah. So like you create a charity, mm -hmm. the charity gets paid the rake, the rate or the charity then hires you as an organizer paying you out of said rake mm -hmm. and you make some amount of money. Yeah, yeah. something close. Uh, so that's usually the flow of how these things work. But I don't know. I mean, what was this? A 50 person tournament? Like, no, first was like 60,000, I think. I, yeah. thought, I thought it was a 50K prize pool. Or you said it's 50K He's outstanding. 50K, oh, he, yeah, he like short on 50K. everything. I see, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe they raked 20, 30,000. I think Chad Holloway tweeted that he was sitting at a table with him and the guy just said, fuck you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, man. The thing is, is, this story is old as... Yeah, it's only c coming back up because he won the... Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying, like, it, it's a story as old oh, as like time it just happens a lot. in poker. Yeah. Like, we just see this so... We're so fucking numb right. to the small time swindlers and scammers yeah i mean it just seems like if he were like ill-intended it just seems like there's easier ways to scam people that wouldn't 
involve like organizing an, an entire tournament going and buying a bunch of silver scamming 300 people that cast a tournament yeah like it just seems like that is like probably the least convenient way to do it but i don't know i don't know man people drum up some fucking wild ideas i if i we should have a segment where I just pitch you guys the ideas that get pitched to me on the regular. Yeah. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> Shark Tank yeah. action. Uh, honestly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that segment that happen. That sounds good. Yeah. Yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig through my DMs and I'm going to write, I'm going to take like 100 DMs from one single person. I'm going to write a concise. We'll have your DMs as a segment and my DMs as a segment. Right. They're wildly different. <laughs> Mine are begging for money. Yours are begging for sex. I do get some that are, they're like, <laughs> please send me Bitcoin. But I'm like, I... What do you mean? I, I don't just have reply with for you. nudes? Yeah. Question mark. Like, uh, you send me Bitcoin? <laughs> no, you. <laughs> we just go back and forth. But yeah, I mean, like, uh, just judging by some of the ideas that get thrown my way, people were just very narrow in their scope of vision. Mm -hmm. And when they get locked in on an idea, yeah. they're very hard to move off of it. Yeah. So uh, I can't tell you how much time I've wasted trying to very politely explain to somebody why an idea is bad or won't work. And it's my own fault because they're not pitching me the idea looking for objective feedback. Right. They're pitching me the idea looking for support. Yeah. And the best thing You're for like, me yeah, to say dude, is like, great. no, sorry, I don't see it. Right. right. Like I've responded before where it was like, sorry, this is a conflict of interest or something else I've been, uh, I'm working on. And I've gotten like 30 DMS thereafter. Yeah. Continuing with the pitch. Yeah. It's just like, well, what are, what are we doing here? Like, right. do you want to just tell me your whole idea so that whatever my conflict of interest is can steal it? Or not that we would, because it's a terrible idea anyway. <laughs> but, but it's like, um, it, it's very clear to me that people get determined. Yeah. Once they've, and I, I recognize this from watching Shark Tank too. Mm -hmm. People come in with a very bad pitch. They're expecting like all the accolades. Right. Probably because like they everyone they've so pitched much work it to has this. been like, wow. We're so proud of yeah. you. Yeah, and then six billionaires <laughs> look them in the face and go, "You're an idiot." Yeah. <laughs> and they just walk and out like, crying. I'll show you, man. Yeah, I'll <laughs> show you. I'm not an idiot, man. I'm not. And like it's Mr. Wonderful like sitting that. there going, "Like, please, I beg of you for the love of money, cut your losses <laughs> yeah. and end this. Like, kill this idea. Yeah. Just bury it, stuff its head under the water until it drowns. I want to see this idea die." And they're just like, "I appreciate the sentiment." But I'll show you. Yeah, it's always I'm I'll be show back. you. That's like their their like movie climax yeah, it's moment. It's like, hey guy, this isn't a fucking challenge. <laughs> like maybe six people who have accumulated ten percent of the world's worth right. <laughs> have an idea of what works and what doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like the uh, yeah. It's uh, the thing is that I think not enough people are discouraged, uh, and I mean that in a very in a very honest and helpful way not mm. in a i know better than you kind of way uh what, what i mean mostly though is that ideas are a dime a dozen like nobody's idea is worth a pint of piss yeah like i don't care if you have an idea to change the world uh, an idea to cure hunger or anything along those lines it's fucking meaningless if the execution isn't feasible 100%. and attainable yeah right so if you aren't if you're the idea guy but you are positive that you cannot execute on it worthless yeah because here's the you truth need an executor yeah but not even that it's like here's the truth that nobody wants to tell you your idea has been thought of before mm -hmm. by hundreds of other people who also couldn't execute on it so it's just like the vast majority of the, pe the things that get pitched to me we have emails uh, oh, i can't wait to do this segment we have emails <laughs> they're just like oh i heard the podcast today and uh you know you talking about poker media and stuff like that here's an idea why don't you get eight people and have them play poker out loud and then have four coaches come in and take two students each underneath their wings and then you coach them and then have them play poker out loud again it's a show it's like what about that as a novel idea? Yeah. This has been done in literally every single industry. And the reason you don't see it in poker is because it's fucking hard to execute. Number one, strategy is not that transferable. Mm -hmm. Number two, there's nothing visual in the strategy. If I'm a UFC fighter and I teach you a leg sweep, I can see your fucking progress and yeah. I can film it and show it to the world. Right. If I'm a poker coach and I get you training on a fucking GTO trainer, nobody's going to recognize that you went from making 0.1 big blind mistakes on the river to now breaking even. Mm -hmm. That's meaningless to them, right? Yeah. It's like, oh my God. Oh my God. He's 75% potted there. That's right. so I think that the fucking good. arc of like 
coaching and seeing people's progress is probably not the it's story insane arc. It's and just... it's the it's the clearest sign of a bullshitty snake oil company yeah the ones that are sitting there saying like oh, i just want to celebrate another mtt victory by user xxx99 it's like bro you're posting a 5k score from a random user of a hundred. It's right. like, of course somebody had a fucking score. Yeah. That's how tournaments work. Yeah. You have a hundred members and they're all playing a Sunday schedule. Mm -hmm. I would hope to God you have a fucking ROI of some, something. Yeah. I mean, I think that pro it's probably focusing on the personalities themselves and not like the For arc sure. of, of growing in skill because it's just fucking boring to watch someone like study. Right. It's just so boring. Right. And you know who's <laughs> already doing that and has the market fucking cornered hmm. and why these reality shows can't exist without them? Why? The vloggers. Oh, the vloggers. Because yeah. they're doing it over hundreds of hours. Yeah. In any given year, a startup vlogger is probably putting out 20 to 50 episodes. And they're all going to be somewhere between 10. I'm seeing new ones popping. I'm not going to lie. Like the YouTube poker scene. It's, it's popping. It is. Like I, every few days I see like vlog number one and it has like 30K views. It's, it's probably 10 times more recognizable than, uh, than the most well-accomplished online pros. Yeah. I know way more about random startup vloggers that probably are not beating 1-3 than I do Linus, Barry Sweets, and the collective that are beating like 50, 100, 6 max online. Yeah. Because we just don't see anything. Right. Nobody highlights it. Well, and it's against their interest to show everything too. So right. it's like, it's just different. They're just different categories of of. Yeah, for sure. People. It's like the best poker players in the world are anonymous and probably aren't ever going to be in the limelight because their trajectory and rightfully so, because this this industry is so goddamn capped mm -hmm. and the ceiling is so relatively low if you're an expert at this field, their trajectory is to learn at a very young age, win a whole bunch of money over a short period of time, and leave. Yeah, and invest it yeah. and do something else, basically. Yeah. Network, invest, grow your wealth. But by 27, get the fuck out, mm -hmm. right? And I know that I'm not doing the, the, the community service by saying, like, that should be the end goal. Well, that's the end goal for the people who are, like, not, like, they're just focused solely on the game and winning as much as they can only from the game. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't think that, I, I think the fall from grace from that is bad, right? So now you're talking about, like, 80% uh, of the population that's attempting to spend 10 to 20 years with this as their career. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you that for 99.9% .9 of you, you'll hit that final year, whether it's year five, 10, 15, or 20, and you will have very little money saved up. Right. So you will just now be older mm -hmm. and wiser and having had lived a pretty nice independent lifestyle. Don't get me wrong. That's worth a lot. Yeah. The ability to grind and make like 50 to 150 K a year for some portion of your life where you don't have to answer to a boss mm -hmm. you don't have to put in 2,000 hours a year You're playing a game for a living and you get to play a game for a living that is worth a whole lot and I wouldn't ever discourage anybody from pursuing it but understand what's on the other side of it because if you don't recognize that whenever you finally get to a point where like you're not meeting your ends meet mm -hmm. through gameplay any longer or you've just clearly leveled off and there's nowhere left to go mm -hmm. and you need to pivot and make another move in your life Understand how hard that's going to be right. because you've never worked for anybody. You've never answered to anybody. You don't have any discernible skills necessarily. Don't get me wrong. Like poker players in and of themselves are very employable, very intelligent, have a lot of uh, intangibles, mm -hmm. but there's nothing you're going to put on a resume that's going to wow anybody. Yeah. So you better make some good fucking contacts gotta, along yeah, the way. Network. <laughs> yeah. Network your dick off. Yeah. But it is a really good game to network in. It really is. Like, it's amazing. one of the best and it'll carry forward once you do get into that more corporate path should you choose to go that way. Or if you're entrepreneurial, you know, have some sort of pivot there that you can delve into. Just make sure that it's not a fucking idea. If you've been hanging on to an idea for so half a decade. In, what he's saying is send all of your ideas to his please. email. Yep, I'm just going to create he's an, becoming an angel investor. I, I'm just going to create an email called like bad ideas at software Yeah. <laughs> and what, that'll just be our segment moving forward. You never know. Yo, what about strike gold? What about Pat McAfee? Oh, I didn't get to watch WrestleMania. I mean, I just saw I, a I couple just got of the see, highlights and I yeah. have one question for you. What happened you. to him? What would be more of a dream to get the people's elbow? 
or a Stone Cold. Oh, the People's Elbow, not even close. <laughs> not even close. Not even close. Not even the close. Rock is so much larger than life compared yeah. to Steve Austin. Like, don't get me wrong. As a kid, what what do you think? Still, the Rock. Back? It's not. It, Steve Austin was a heel. Like he was on. Uh, you liked him, but you liked him to hate him. Right, like he was just this redneck hillbilly who smashed beer over his fucking head, <laughs> and was just like the 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 real uh, the real, I guess, mystery to Steve Austin was he was kind of a bad guy, but he also was kind of like a celebrated bad guy because he never really aligned. So most of the yeah. heels in wrestling were like aligned with Vince McMahon or aligned with like some bad entity, mm -hmm. and they were just cultivated that way. But like the Undertaker and Steve Austin specifically, they were just kind of like built as these characters that just didn't answer to anybody, and they were never good guys because they weren't helping anybody. They were obviously selfish and looking out for number one and stuff like that. But they weren't exactly bad guys either. Yeah, they weren't with anybody. He wasn't with the Click. He was just right, kind of right, by himself. Yeah. Just, lone just wolf. a solo entity, start to finish. Yeah. Where like the Rock. He, he like was brought up as a baby face, then he was turned heel, and uh, I think there was a time where he was aligned with um, maybe Heartbreak Kid and that whole crew. Uh, but the reason, why, the reason why Austin was hated, then loved, then you know, flip-flopping all the time is because they pit him against Bret Hart, who was the biggest name in the industry at the mm -hmm. time, but McMahon was going to rug his ass, and he ultimately <laughs> did. Um, it ended up being uh, a match for Shawn Michaels where he didn't know he was supposed to lose the belt. Uh, so they didn't tell Brett. And then they quick counted him in the ring and Shawn Michaels won the championship. The, bro, if you've never seen this, <laughs> there's a documentary. It was on A&E. It's incredible. Like, uh, to the point where I think, like, Bret Hart went into Vince McMahon's office. The cameras were, like, following him and stuff. And, the, and you couldn't see, but you could hear. And he, like, beat the fuck out of Vince McMahon. <laughs> like, that was his last day in the WWE. But, um, like, yeah, with The Rock, it was just, like, the natural progression was, like, he was, he was a heel for a short period of time. But it was just clear that his charisma and his showmanship was just second to none. Yeah. And very, very quickly, he just became the face of the WWE. Like the face of everything. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, people try to compare like Cena to him now and, and say like, and that's fair. Like Cena was a big part of the WWE and kind of the face for a long time. But I think the only comparison for the celebrity status that the rock had in the WWE was Hulk Hogan. I think I, like there's nobody that. else that parallels the popularity that the rock had. And it's only grown since he's left the WWE. Like, he's such a global entity now that even him just going back and making appearances, I know he wrestled at WrestleMania, uh, it was like two or three years ago, right before COVID, he actually wrestled Cena. And it was like the biggest WrestleMania in the history of WrestleMania. It's no shock, right? Yeah, it's like, Cena's huge. They're both like, movie stars now. Yeah. Neither one of them are wrestling, right? And that makes sense. Like, that's the pivot. Like, you spend all that time building up this charisma, this ability to work an audience, and the ability to do it impromptu. Uh, it just translates, right? It's like now all you have to know is how to read lines, how to memorize and, and get out there and do it. And I mean, I don't know. It's not like The Rock is making any fucking uh, head-turning movies. They're all exactly what you would expect them to be. I mean, they're pretty good movies, though. They're, they're good, but they're good on a shower. They're, they're, they're definitely seven and a half. They're on no, the I, I love everything he's in, yeah. but like, you know, they're relatively shadow. I, what, I, what I love about him is he's actually very funny. Yeah. Um, he, he carries the comedic role incredibly well, but it's like, you know, he's not out there making goodwill hunting. No, sure. We're never going to see that. Not that know? I've seen goodwill hunting, but I understand what you're We've, what? I literally saying? watched that movie I... with you. <laughs> <laughs> we watched goodwill hunting. Uh, yeah. Was How I watching high? the movie or was I playing poker? You were watching. What is this movie I about? I fell asleep. You were watching it. You've never seen it either? Yes. I've, I've seen oh. it multiple times, but okay. we, we watched it. You were, you Matt Damon, the, Ben Affleck, Robin Williams. Yeah, I know the white guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's no black guys in this movie. Uh, but I don't remember. He's a janitor. Starts doing math. On super the, smart. Extremely complicated math equations on the board. And then the professor decides to help him you, out. You really need to see this movie. He's seen it. Well, I I mean, mind you guys, okay. This doesn't sound like I watched the whole thing. I want to remind you guys that marijuana is a memory loss drug. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I have a very yep. fucking good memory. <laughs> marijuana was bad, okay? <laughs> you remember to roll those joints. <laughs> it's the devil's lettuce.
All right. Well, I have one last piece of uh, business to wrap up. I was supposed to do this in the beginning and I forgot. Um, we have a winner for this past week's Poker Out Loud Hand of the Week. 247 answers. One yeah. person wow. got it correct. <laughs> one person got that it correct. makes your life easy. What? Wait, what? That makes your life easy. It really did make my life easy. I didn't have to randomize anything. Uh, shout out to my man. Branson po- Brant Zen Poker, who guessed King Nine of Diamonds. That is the correct answer. I, I got to tell you. Give it up for Brant. Give it up. Excellent Give job, Brant. He came in at the 11th Damn. hour. 200 and how many? 200 and what? Like 270 some wow. entries. Wow, and he was the only one who got it right. That's, one person got that's, it right. Uh, came impressive. in at the 11th hour, literally like at 11.30 p.m. last night. He goes, King Nine of Diamonds. I'm just, I saw it. I saw it in real time pop up on my notifications on Instagram. I was like, God damn. Somebody <laughs> he knew got a it week right. ago. He was, just wait, he was just waiting us out. What's <laughs> remarkable to me. He definitely messaged Landon and said he would split the prize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, 15 bucks each. Let's uh, go. <laughs> what's remarkable to me is how clear the instructions were between the tweet and the graphic and how many people just like failed to read the details. So first and foremost, in Landon's quote, he says, we do not block the suited queens. Okay. The queen is the queen of diamonds. Therefore, his hand has to possess diamonds. Just has to. There's nothing else it could be, right? Then I include the four bet range on the graphic. Green being hands that he calls the three bet with, purple being the hands that he calls the four bet with. And explicitly said in the tweet, purple are the hands that he four bets. I can't tell you how many people were like pocket deuces, pocket threes, well, pocket fours. I mean, I was like, you're out. Right. Well, you know, people should just maybe read it, read it a couple times, figure it out. Because like, if you're putting clues in the description, then you know you're gonna narrow it down. Two hundred and seventy some guesses. Over that. They just look and see and like, hmm, okay, I think it's this. Two hundred and seventy some guesses. I think uh, I didn't count it, but like of the actual viable hands that could have qualified as a reasonable guess, I would say that there's got to be, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's call it 20. There's at most 20 hands that could have qualified. At most. Sounds like a good time to plug the academy. <laughs> <laughs> That's very fair. So if you want to learn how to read instructions better, um, no, we do have a new poker out loud out today also. So if you guys would like to see that, head to solveyy.io. Um, on top of that, there was one other thing other than the Academy I was supposed to plug, but Andre has the graphic up. So we'll plug the Academy <laughs> coming up at the end of April. We've sold out the first flight. We are opening up a second flight for anybody who is interested in attending the new poker out loud Academy. If you've always had dreams of playing poker out loud, this is your opportunity. You'll get two full sessions playing I almost said nine-handed poker, but that's not guaranteed. You'll get two full sessions playing Poker Out Loud style format where you are asked to speak your thoughts in real time whenever it's your turn to take action. The other two days will be spent studying theory. Again, uh, we'll mostly focus on the principles on day one and the mechanics on day two. Uh, Sorry, I was reading production notes. Too much for to keep it, for me to keep up with now. Um, also, just launched is a new course by Michael Lukic on the site Intro to Solvers. If you are new to solving or uh, are a little bit intimidated by the idea of utilizing PO or other solvers, GTO Plus, etc., this is an excellent two and a half hour long course that uh, Michael specializes in. He's a data analyst by trade. So he does a really great job of breaking it down to its most rudimentary core, basically removes the intimidation factor, teaches you how to set up parameters, teaches you how to read outputs, teaches you how to scrutinize and calibrate those outputs better for your actual in-game strategies. Head on over to solveforwide.io if you wanna check that out. We are offering two week free trial as always. You can cancel anytime. That's gonna do it for us today. We appreciate you guys all sticking around, listening Tomorrow to... Tomorrow we have a special guest. Is it confirmed? Yes. It's confirmed? Wow. Wow. There's going to be a lot of fucking estrogen A very in this special room. guest. 
There already um, is. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, Wait, can you give us any hints on? Um, the est be... estrogen. She oh. has a vagina. Okay. It's confirmed. <laughs> She's got a vagina. Confirmed. Okay. Confirmed. Um, so the kitty corner's back snows. tomorrow, is what you're saying. I gotta get your camera working. Sounds like you you gotta get over in that kitty corner. Nah. <laughs> You, you two girls can go beak in your corner. Yeah. Uh huh. You uh, nice special camera. guest tomorrow. We're gonna have the one and only Marles Barkley joining us. That is uh, loosely confirmed through Melissa. It might just be fake news. To say her actual name so they know for sure. Oh, they don't know who Marles Barkley is. They know who Marles. No, you're the only person. That Stop. Know. That's her. That's. Oh, I guess she changed it. <laughs> it used to be her IG handle. Uh, Marley Sprague. We'll be joining us tomorrow in studio. Uh, and if you guys do a good job of, of uh, spamming her on Twitter and in the chat, maybe we can get her for the entire week since uh, the kitty corner is completely vacant. We're slowly dropping off one by one. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Landon's traveling and Chin's seemingly dead. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to start calling the hospitals and jails. Right. Which one do you think I should call first? Definitely not a hospitals. jail. Hospitals. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I don't. I mean, he's a hypochondriac, but he's into some shady shit. So it's yeah. like, eh, I don't Flip know. Finally, find him. They're like, yeah, he's been here for a week. He has a mild cold. <laughs> <laughs> we found him outside yeah. the emergency room doors. He said he had the sniffles. <laughs> uh, Chin, if you don't want uh, all this bashing, you better just get back here as soon as possible. He just storms through the door. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Shut the is. fuck up, you guys. <laughs> He's been lying in bed for five days with just an IV drip. We don't know how to get rid of him. <laughs> All right, that's a wrap. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace.